So when developing AI, there are a lot of moments of pivot in there, right? Like this technology keeps changing and you always have to stay agile and adapt to what becomes possible, what, what is now in reach. Today, we're installing and commissioning NVIDIA's GB200 and VL72 racks. So uh, you can look at the DJX as a Formula One car in AI. So uh, 30 years ago, when we built supercomputers, we called it HPC computing, so high-performance computing. I would call the system a high-performance AI system. The challenging part in this project has been that this has never been done before. So we've had to design a data center infrastructure around uh, a, a type of rack that has never before been built or installed or, or commissioned or operated. So the challenging part here has been to get all technical details sorted out before the technical information was actually available. It's a flurry of both excitement and a bunch of work to do this well. Running these computers at scale, these supercomputers, is not like buying a laptop at all, right? It's way closer to actually building a new house and also moving in. One interesting problem we had to solve ad hoc is that the floor load that was permissible in our data center was insufficient to just bring the racks from the outside trucks and lorries into the data center hall. So we had to scramble and find some steel plates to basically like spread that load over a wider area. And those are problems that you will absolutely run into when building a supercomputer that you might not think about. We are running AI factories here. It's like the infrastructure part is just something that has previously not been nearly as a substantial part in software development, but is absolutely necessary for AI development. The other thing that uh, we are changing is uh, we want to be also more environment friendly. And that's why we're talking a lot with Eco Data Center. And we are happy that Eco Data Center um, was kind of uh, very, very good at their forecast that the, the, the area of liquid cooling will come. We will bring the, the, the GGX system with direct liquid cooling. So that means we bring cold water into the, into the compute tray. Uh, there are kind of chips, uh, 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 plates, cold plates, and they cool, uh, they cool the GPUs and the hot water comes back. And then it can be reutilized uh, yeah, for, for something. Uh, it's, uh, the, waste, uh, the, the heat is not wasted. EcoDC is going through a lot of effort and pain to make sure that we are not only providing the infrastructure necessary, but also doing so in a way that is sustainable and respects the entire ecosystem. With the high density racks, liquid cooling is needed. And with liquid cooling, it means that we get much higher temperatures coming out from the data hall. And this higher temperature can be used for reusage of heat in a nearby biofuel production plant. For Blackwell specifically, it's not just that the individual units got faster. There is an entire change in architecture based away from basically node-based computing, where you interconnect eight GPUs together and can sort of view them as one, to rack-based computing, where you do the same thing but with 72 GPUs in an entire rack. That opens up possibilities that we can only guess at today. To simplify things a lot, what you can imagine is, like, think about all the things you'd like your model to do, and you test them. And then you increase model size and test again. And what happens is that the performance on individual tests does not gradually increase with model size. Instead, it's a step change. Some task is not working at all until you have reached a certain threshold of computational size and model capability. And all of a sudden, the same test with the same setup is working much, much better than anyone would have projected. A specific instance of this is Seabell Clarify. That's a feature that has been on our wish list for years, right? We're talking about maybe 2020, but it just never was in reach to even 
try to tackle that kind of problem with increased model capabilities, with these much more flexible architectures. Not only was it possible to do this, it all of a sudden got comparatively simple. And uh, now with Blackwell, we expect the same things to happen again. Those in turn entirely change the model capabilities because of these emergent abilities in LLMs that we've explored for a couple of years now. And that in turn, once we have like gone through this entire research pipeline, dramatically changes how people interact with the products. They're going to become more interactive, more personalized, and how exactly this is going to shape out is the journey that we are on right now.